sermon passage this morning <clears throat> comes from the book of Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Matthew, chapter 19, verses 16 through 30, on page 18 in the Pew Bible, if you'd like to join along. Then someone came to him and said, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear full, false witness. Honor your mother and father also. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, I have kept all these. What, shall, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you wish to be perfect, go, sell your possessions, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When the young man heard this word, he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly, I tell you, it will be hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for anyone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astounded and said, Then who can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but for God all things are possible. Then Peter said in reply, Look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Jesus said to them, Truly, I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man is seated on the throne of his glory, you have you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Holy God, we thank you that your ancient words are ever true and that they are no longer just in the past, but they are present and alive today with us, changing us. Lord, help us to come with open hearts so that we let your words impart on us. In your name we pray. Amen. So the summer before I went to my freshman year of college, I worked in a factory that made custom laminated beams. Um, I had worked at a sandwich shop before that in high school, but as I was realizing that books in college are really expensive, you kind of sometimes need um, a higher paying job to to pay off those books. So I went to work in this factory, um, and, and it can be expensive to make mistakes when they're custom laminated beams. And so until they knew that they could trust me, until they knew I could follow directions and you know would drill the holes on the beam exactly where they needed them to be drilled, um, they kind of gave me the easiest and lowest jobs uh, until they knew, you know, you, okay, you can do that, now the next job up, and then the next job up, and then the next job up. Um, <clears throat> so since it's a wood factory, there is a lot of sawdust around that continually needs to get swept up and moved out of the way. And though I'm sure this is an exaggeration, it felt like all I did for about two weeks straight was just sweeping up wood saw, you know, sawdust and, and sucking it up through the, I mean, it was a really cool sucker thing at least. That, that was fun. <laughs> but, but not an exaggeration was 
that I was doing it so much that I began dreaming of sweeping up sawdust, right, in my dreams. I mean, have you ever done tasks so over and over and over again that they become part of your dreams? I know I'm not rare here, right? You know, or that you have problems that you're working on in your brain or there's some mental task that you go to sleep and it turns out you're dreaming about it too, right? Well, this week while I was doing sermon prep and reading our scripture passage uh, this morning, I dreamed that I was on vacation with a bunch of my family members and we were staying in some place that I knew in my dream that the place had a hidden entrance and there was a passageway. I just knew it that I, and so I was obsessed in my dream about finding this hidden passageway and I, I eventually found it. And once I did, the, the size of the place that we were staying at, it tripled in size. There were tons of rooms. It was amazing. There was a pool that was, had been hidden and that now you had access to pool and all these cool things. And when I woke up that next morning, I was amused by my, my, my dream because I knew that it, it was my brain trying to process the passage that I had been working on all this week, right, while I slept. This morning, we're studying a story about a man who is looking for something. He knows he's missing something and that there's something more that he just doesn't have or doesn't understand. And this question about how to get eternal life. In my dream, I could sense that I just knew I was missing something, that there was something more, and I kept searching until I found it. Um, so I was copying, right, in my dream, what I thought maybe the man in our passage was going through, feeling, doing. So let's catch up from where we left off last week in our series of Growing with Peter. Last week in the story was the story of Jesus' transfiguration, and Peter and the rest of the disciples were reminded by God to put their listening ears on, you know, right, when they're with Jesus. Remember to, to not be a duck. Uh, we had our little stuffed duck up here, thanks to someone in our congregation. Because uh, a duck has ears and a duck can hear, but they're not actually listening, right? You need to actively listen and allow Jesus' lives to transform us, like the song just spoke about, about ancient words, transforming us, changing me, changing you, right? So to truly follow Jesus with our whole lives, we have to listen. So since then, we're kind of skipping over one kind of really big story that involved Peter, and we just didn't have time for everyone, and I've preached on this one before, but I want to touch on it. It just seems like maybe Peter has been putting on his listening ears because the topic of forgiveness comes up in Matthew chapter 18, right before our chapter. And in Jewish rabbinic tradition, that uh, they have spoken on this topic of forgiveness, and they have decided that to forgive people, you only have to forgive people three times. Uh, after three times, you don't have to forgive them anymore. So three times is the rabbinic tradition. But Peter, by this time, has spent some time with Jesus and has realized that Jesus has continually been pushing them, calling them to be disciples, and, and asking them to think beyond traditional thought, right? So he's been using his listening ears, and he's trying to be smart and, and showing that he's beginning to understand things a bit. And so the rabbis say three, but Jesus would expect more from us. So maybe seven times is how many times we should forgive. And Jesus, rather humorously in this interaction, says, well, how about 77 times, right? And if, if counting and keeping count is your focus, Peter, then you're focusing on the wrong thing. And as followers of Jesus, we're to be focusing on how to bring reconciliation and restoration back to relationships and community. And so that involves way more and keeping a ledger of everyone in our life and checking off, well, how many times have I forgiven them, right? So to forgive, so you know, we are to forgive so many times that we shouldn't even be keeping count, shouldn't even be thinking about keeping count. Forgiveness is just a part of our life like breathing is as a disciple. And I think Jesus was telling Peter in that moment, 
keep going. You're starting to understand, but you're still missing this bigger picture. You're focusing on the wrong thing. And turns out that that's pretty much the same message that Jesus is going to give to Peter along with the rest of the disciples today at the very end of our passage. So Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem for the time frame that we're in, and it's about six months before Jesus' crucifixion, so if, if that's important to understand time frame. So it takes some time to get to Jerusalem, and, and Jesus is teaching, he's answering questions along the way, and at times he's being tested by Pharisees and teachers of the law. And as Jesus is interacting with the crowd, this gentleman, this most likely a uh, religious lay leader, comes up to the Jesus, he's from the community, probably well known to the locals, and he asks him a very important question about how to get eternal life. And to be clear, when the question of eternal life is being asked, it isn't a question of how not to die. How not to die, how to just to keep on going along, right? How to continue in his existence, or even how to go to heaven. That's not what he's asking here. Um, N.T. Wright, he's a New Testament scholar, he explains that at this point, Jews kind of had a, had a two-period kind of history. The now, what you're living in, everything that's going on, um, but then there was an age to come, a time when God would come and everything that was wrong would be set right. God would come, save Israel, and lead a kingdom of justice and of peace. When there would be new life, right? God would reign and, and death and decay and evil would be gone. And so the man is asking, how can I make sure that I'm saved for that? How that age to come, how can I be a part of God's kingdom when it's all made right? That's what he's asking, not just immortality here. So Jesus gives the answer <clears throat> that he gives often when people ask this question of him. He goes, you have to follow God's commandments, right? If you want to enter life, Jesus says to the man, keep the commandments. Okay, but which ones? Let's be specific here. What's the most important one? The man wants to know. Because the rules that had been created to help people follow the, the law of God that was handed on you know, through Moses, it was immense. There were tons of rules. And so help me focus, Jesus. Which ones, which ones are you talking about that are the most important? And not shockingly, Jesus lists a lot of the Ten Commandments. I hope you recognize some of those as the Ten Commandments, right? Because they, as his answer, they for sure were seen as the most important, non-negotiables at that time. So if you look at the ones that Jesus names, it's inter interesting to look at the ones that he lists and the ones that he leaves out. Don't murder, com don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't give false testimony, honor your parents, and then he adds this second of the greatest commandments, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. Everything that Jesus lists are community-based commandments. How do we live with one another? How are we in relationship with one another? How do we treat each other? Yes, yes, says the man, I, I follow all of those but I still am missing something. I, I sense it. I, what am I lacking? What am I missing? Well, if you want to follow me, if you want to be complete in your discipleship, Jesus says, then sell your possessions, give to the poor, and follow me. Jesus points to the heart of the issue, and without listing them, the theme of the rest of the Ten Commandments that he didn't name, but 
the summary of which is the greatest commandment, basically, to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your strength. That's what Jesus is calling attention to here. After hearing Jesus' response, we read that the young man, he walks away. And he's sad because he has great wealth. The truth is, he probably didn't have a really hard time living with those community-based commandments. Most likely, he even gave to the poor. Living generously was part of Jewish custom life. It was encouraged. He was rich. So these were, in general, were not hard commandments for him to follow, the community ones. He didn't need to steal. He didn't need to murder. He doesn't need to lie. He could love his neighbor, help out periodically. He was checking off all those boxes. But Jesus' answer to the young man was not about checking off boxes. It was about getting right down to the heart of the matter. Jesus was challenging the man to really see who was ruling him. What was controlling him? What did he love most? What or who was his God? Money or God? I don't know if any of you have done this, but I've seen this in TV as a joke, or I'm sure kids have done this too. Uh, um, maybe some of you have. I probably have done it in my past, but you know, sometimes there's a, a, something you see and you put your hand in and you try to grab it. It's a tight spot. You wiggle in and then you grab it, but then you can't get your hand out because <laughs> once you get it into that tight spot and expand to grip, it won't come out, right? <laughs> It's stuck. And so there's no way to get it out or to even get your hand back anymore unless you let go. And this young man was not willing to let go. That's the issue that was going on. He wasn't willing to let go. His wealth had become his identity, his purpose in life, his God. And be, before I go on, I want to say that this passage is absolutely about money and possessions. That Jesus is quite confrontational in his teaching about money and wealth and how dangerous it is, how dangerous they are, because they trick us into thinking that we don't need God. Money provides false security and safety and power, and they, they provide uh, so that we don't have to be as anxious in this world. But I don't think, for us, that this passage is only about money. It's about money, but it's not only about money. It might be one of the dangerous things that keep people from worshiping God, but we'd be naive if we thought it was the only thing that kept people from worshiping God, right? No matter who we are, we all have something that tries to take over as priority in our lives. This passage is really asking us, where are we getting our identity from? Is it from wealth? Is it from possessions? Is it from our family and our friends? Is it from our ability to play sports? Is it from our success at school? Is it from our military service? Is it from our careers? Is it from our academic degrees? Is it from our political positions? Or is it from our popularity? Or is it from God? It's pretty scary easy for us to lean into all these things of the world that help tell the story of our lives, but start to believe that they're the most important things about us. The question about what's the most important thing in our lives what we can't live without starts to get answered with all these earthly things instead of our identity as children of God. After this interaction, Jesus goes on to really drive home this point about money and these idols in our lives. In attention-grabbing fashion, Jesus says that it's, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich 
to enter the kingdom of God. In the mid-90s, Bill Pullman, an actor, he was a guest host on Saturday Night Live, and they actually did a skit about this passage. And Pullman, in the skit, he plays a billionaire that was working to figure out how to get camels through the eye of a needle so that billionaires could go to heaven. It was actually quite amusing. And so first they tried liquefying a camel. Well, first they tried to shove a horse through a straw, they said, and that didn't work. Um, and then they tried liquefying camels to pour it through the eye of a needle, but they thought maybe that was cheating. And so instead they were using all their technology to create tiny, tiny camels and really big needles, <laughs> right, with eyes in them so that they could have camels willy-nilly walking through eyes of needles. And at one point, Pullman says, unless I've completely missed the message of the Bible, somewhere in here is my ticket to heaven, right? And if we can't get the camel to go through the eye of the needle, we have another plan. We are prepared to spend millions to get that part taken out of the Bible. I thought, this is an excellent skit, right? It was so well done because it was humorous in ways that it shows it kind of exactly what we do as humans. And it exemplifies Jesus' warning to us. Instead of allowing God to change us, transform us so that we can be obedient to God, instead of focusing on our identity in Jesus and, and letting that be the priority of our lives, we instead work to find loopholes, right? Or rationalizations for other ways that, you know, for why other things can become more important in our lives or, or even just as important as God. So it's okay that we put something equal with God in our lives. And though none of us would seriously think about spending millions of dollars to have parts of scripture removed, I hope we want, but we don't need to do that. We are really good, right, at ignoring the parts that challenge us, that make us uncomfortable. We're good at ignoring the parts that ask us to question our mindset, to question our behaviors, our loyalties, our priorities. We are rich in our idols. And when we're rich in prioritizing things that are not God, it's hard to be a disciple. It's hard to live in the kingdom of God. Well, then who can be saved, right? Who can be saved then? If the people that seem to have it all and the people that have it all together and the wealthy, you know, which the disciples took as a blessing from God, people that are wealthy, people that have it all together, right? If they're struggling, if they can't be saved, then who can be saved? With man, this is impossible, says Jesus. But with God, all things are possible. The only way that those who are wealthy can have a healthy detachment from their wealth and understand that all of it belongs to God and that they're to use it as a blessing to help others is to let God rule in their hearts and transform them so that they love the Lord with all their hearts, their minds, and their soul. The only way that those who are successful at their jobs or in their service or successful at school can make sure that they don't have and form an unhealthy attachment to those successes, to that identity, is to let God rule in their hearts and transform them so that they love the Lord their God with all their hearts, their minds, their soul, and their strength. The only way that those who have talents for sports or arts or communication and relationships or are popular or have influence with people the only way that they to make sure that they don't have unhealthy attachments to it and take that as their identity is to let God rule in their hearts 
and transform them so they love the Lord their God with all their heart, their strength, their souls, and their mind. You're seeing a pattern here, right? But we can't do it on our own. That's the point. It's only possible with God. It's only when we turn to God, when we truly love God, that we can give all of ourselves to him in our discipleship. So it's time for our current favorite disciple, Peter, to make an appearance now, to ask his question. He's been listening this whole time and processing. Okay, okay, Jesus, but then what about us? What about me? What about us? We, we did give up everything. We're letting you transform us. What is there for us then? And Jesus answers so affirmatively, yes, Peter, you have followed me and are going to be with me in the kingdom of God. There are rewards for those that make this commitment to worship God and God alone. The blessings of the kingdom of God are and will be overwhelming compared to what you think is good here on earth. But Peter, remember, the first will be last, and the last will be first. Peter, your focus might be a little off on that question. Because as easy as it is to worship other things and other idols other than God in this world, and therefore walk away from Jesus like the young man did in our story today, as followers of Jesus, it's also really easy to get blinded or forgetful of our purpose and follow Jesus for somewhat selfish reasons. To follow Jesus because of the rewards that we're going to get. Our faith is not supposed to be about what we get out of our relationship with God. It's not about getting to live in paradise. It's not about getting to see our beloved family and friends who have gone before us in heaven. It's not about the rewards and what we get. Our faith in God is about God and God alone. Being with the one who created us, the one who wants us, the one who loved us so much that he wouldn't leave us to fend for ourselves alone and try to fix the brokenness and hurt and evil in this world all by ourselves because we couldn't do it. But instead, he went to the cross to die so that we might fully live with him. Though our whole life is one of discipleship and doing the work to stay focused on God, but we know, if we're honest, as humans, we get distracted, right? We stray, we're tempted to add things to our faith, things that are not of God. And that's why it's so vital that we have these seasons like Lent and Advent that specifically call us back to God, that remind us that we need to get back to our basics of our faith, that it's, not, that it's just about us and God. It's why I, we do extreme measures at times as pastors and we clear out the entire you know, front area um, and remind us it's about God. It's about the cross. It's about scripture. It's about the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's about God and us and our relationship. That's our focus of our Christian life. And instead of asking, what about me, God? Like Peter, what do, what do we get out of this, God? What do I get? Instead, it's a call to ask, what am I lacking? Am I missing anything? Is there something that is taking your place, Lord, in my life? And then to bring it to God and let him shape our hearts and restore us back to him. 
So we have a couple more weeks of Lent. And so as we continue in this season of Lent, as we journey to the cross with Jesus, may Christ be our focus and may we give all of ourselves to God so that he can shape us, restore us, and bring us back to him. Let us pray. Thank you, God, for who you are, that you are compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness and forgiveness. God, you know far greater than us the temptations and the distractions of this world that try to call us away from you or try to take your place. Even parts of the the goodness of your kingdom can become a misplaced idol over our restored relationship with you. Call us again back to you, Lord. May we be filled with your goodness and lost in your love. May we open our hearts to you to be transformed and, and love you with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength. Receive now the offering of our lives, our time, and our labor, and feed us with your grace, we pray. And we pray this along with the prayer that you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day your daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.